Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's very good to see you here so early on the second day of the conference. I know it's hard, but if you're braced, ready, and thoroughly caffeinated, let's begin. So I'm going to take you on an exciting adventure throughout the uh, features of type systems of advanced functional programming languages. And the topic, um, as stated on this slide, is quite a mouthful, you know, describing state with dependently typed FSMs, you know, when you have to abbreviate some of the words, you know it's going to be hard. But it is going to be hard, I'm not going to lie. But I'll guide you through step by step, so don't worry. So let's consider types. Some of you may be using TypeScript, right? So there are types, types in TypeScript, obviously. And types are helpful because, you know, they give you a certain peace of mind and comfort uh, when you define that a function accepts a number and then you apply this function to a string that's a compilation error, unless, of course, you cheat, right? So that's, that's nice, isn't it? Before your code is even run, someone, the compiler, is taking care of the correctness for you. And if you consider that types are calculated, reconciled at the compilation stage, and then later they are gone in the result of the TypeScript compilation, you don't see any types if you uh, stop on a breakpoint in the browser, right? Th types are gone. Types are just a meta language, right? So Types, you can, you can think of types as a special language interpreted by the compiler based on logic. You know, it has its own syntax. It leaves, okay, so it's connected to, uh, to the values that you describe with those types, but uh, it's, it, it has its own laws, its own syntax, its own uh, constructs, its own idioms, and so on. So you can think of it as a separate programming language. You know, so when you write in TypeScript, you, you know two languages. You're using JavaScript that you already know, and you're using the uh, syntactic uh, idioms from TypeScript as well. So two languages, right? And if you take this concept that types, type definitions, type signatures are a separate programming language in its own, you can go pretty far with it. So you can program yourself very complicated types and that's um, what's usually referred to as uh, type level programming. And when we speak about type level programming, uh, we usually mean uh, programming languages that were inspired by Haskell one way or another, such as, well, Haskell itself, uh, with a very rich type system, PureScript, Idris, and, well, TypeScript as well, because uh, type level programming in TypeScript is getting quite popular. You can see uh, even libraries that only consider types and don't care really about the values. Uh, to illustrate what I mean by programming language, you can consider this simple TypeScript definition of a very silly interface. It's a generic interface that is, uh, it accepts a type variable, type argument called T here and then does something with it, right, and produces a new type. So you, you get list of strings, list of records, and even nested lists, such as list of list of strings, right? So this uh, interface definition yields an infinite number of types, right, depending on the T that you're using there. So you can think of it as a function from type to type, right? You supply it with a type, you get some other type back. You give it a string, you get a list of string, and so on. Uh, in Idris um, syntax, you can actually write, write it like that. So the signature for list would be something like a function from type to type. So a type for type is a type itself. Right? So you can, you can say, okay, type is some, any type, any type at all, no restrictions. Give me a string, give me a, a list, I don't care. And I will produce some other type. And then what you do with this type, you define below what exactly happens, right? So that's just syntax. Before we go any further, 
just so you're more comfortable with the type signatures in this presentation, which is mostly going to be unfortunately or fortunately in Idris. Um, that's the notation that we're going to be dealing with. That's a function. Uh, you see a function called add, and that's its type signature. It accepts two arguments, two integers, and it produces another integer. So, you know, that's the way you write it with two arrows. If it was, uh, if it had three arguments, it would be int, 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 and another int for the return value. So it's, you know, it's uniform. So that's, just consider that. That's just syntax. It's called Hindley-Milner notation, according to Hindley-Milner uh, type system. So, okay, we can have functions, kind of, sort of, you know, uh, functions on types in the language, but what else can we have on the type level that we're used to on the value level? One example of that is, of course, numbers. I mean, we work with numbers every day. On the value level, it's very simple. You just write uh, number characters, you get number literals, there you go. On the type level, however, we don't, it's not uh, immediately clear how to get uh, numbers. So you have to define them somehow. And of course, you won't be relying on machine representation uh, the way you do on the value level. It's not gonna convert your characters into some kind of bits because your type level language, your types, type definitions are a logical language. So it doesn't really matter uh, how you represent your numbers, they ha just have to make sense, you know, in your logical predicates and all those type signatures that you make using those numbers. So you define them uh, using a recursive type, you know, you have functions on the type level, so we can have likewise recursive functions, no problem. And that's natural numbers. So natural numbers, how, how, how does the signature read? Uh, it's either a zero or a successor of a natural number. So you get zero is just Z, right? Then one is a successor of Z, two is a successor of a successor of Z, and so on and so forth. So you just construct by uh, applying the successor function. Right? And that's all you need to get very primitive natural numbers, so no negative numbers, but that's already enough to, for example, define uh, dependently typed vectors. Uh, typically, uh, in lists, vectors, arrays, and other containers, you have the type for the element, and that's it. But what if we also had a type for length? So our vector is then uh, a function that accepts a natural number, right? Natural on the type level, and then some type for the element, and it produces a vector type. So for example, we would have a vector of three and string, that would be a vector that has, you know, exactly three strings inside. And then the beautiful thing is that you can uh, write uh, functions such as append. You had a vector with a type n, and some element type, and then a vector of the same element type, but of a different length, and then you produce the result of appending of you know, one vector to another is a vector of a third type. You know, it's all three types are different here. Went from n uh, to m to n plus m, because of course you can define addition of those piano numbers of our type level naturals. So you can have plus on the type level as well. And that, in turn, allows you to say that, okay, addition only works for vectors of the same length. You see, n, our length type argument, has to be exactly the same in both cases. So when you add two vectors, their length has to match. Uh, and if you want to zip two vectors of different types, a and b there, then, again, their length has to be the same. Types may be different. Okay, you have a vector of numbers, a vector of strings, you will get a vector of pairs of strings and numbers, but of the same length. Another example of type level awesomeness is uh, a printf function taken to the type level. You know printf, you give it some template and then uh, a few arguments according to the template. So if you have percentage s, it means that it accepts a string argument to substitute, right? And then uh, percentage D means 
uh, an integer, I think, is expected, right? So that, of course, is bad uh, because it can be abused, right? So I Googled for uh, a good picture. I think I Googled unsafe printf, and that's the picture I found. It's the best I could find. It's a bit weird, but anyway, you know, it, it can be abused because no one controls if tem the template matches the arguments that you supply. You can have buffer overruns and so on and so forth, right? So that's the example from an actual library in PureScript with just a little bit of type level magic that connects the type level and the value level. We can have uh, such functions, so it achieves the same result. You give it uh, a formatted string and then uh, some substitution arguments and then it does the trick, but uh, it's um, verified by the compiler. That's the good bit. If you ask the compiler to tell me, well, please tell me the type of the of of all this well, construct, it's going to, to produce this type. It's actually a function of string uh, integer, and it get, gives you a formatted string. So all this this format thing with proxies with the string produces actually. Uh, function that expects exactly the uh, now the, the arguments of, of the uh, types that you see here. So what it does is that it makes the compiler actually parse the string when it compiles your code. The compiler then looks for those uh, percentage patterns and then it deduces the types from that. So it means, okay, if uh, I see a percentage s, I need a function that expects a string. And if I, in addition to that, see percentage d, if, that's, uh, if, if there is such an occurrence, then uh, I have to accept, um, expect an additional int. So you can't, it won't even compile if you don't supply the right arguments if your pattern and your arguments don't match. Uh, finally, there is this. It's a very nice article uh, about the N queens problem. You know how you can put uh, six queens on a chessboard in a way that they don't threaten each other. And the thing is that, okay, in the article, several types are defined and the solution is found completely on the type level without any values at all. So you define uh, the chessboard as types, you define uh, how the queen moves in chess, you know, the moving pattern, all in types. And then you don't even compile your code, you just ask for the type of your solution and it produces the solution. That's the state of the chessboard using those piano numbers, you know, as coordinates where the queens are supposed to be. So no, no values. It, it, the compiler did all the job, right? Your program didn't even run. But enough talking about uh, type level programming. Let's talk about snooker. So snooker is um, an exciting billiards game originating from India, invented by the British officers there. And it's, it's a fun game. Uh, so. If you, if you don't like the rest of the talk, then at least I'll introduce you to snooker if you're not familiar with this game. Uh, basically, you just pot the balls, okay? You take shots, right, with the cue ball, and you have to pot those red balls and the color balls, uh, and then you take turns with another player, and whoever pots more balls is the winner. And then there is a special order. Uh, so first, while there's still reds on the table, you have to pot uh, a red, then any of the colors. You see there is yellow, uh, brown, green, black, pink, and uh, blue. And then another red. And then the color is respotted until there are no more reds left, right? That's the first phase. And then in the second phase, you just pot all the remaining colors in a particular order, and you are awarded uh, a number of points for each color and always one point for red. So you can take red, yellow, red, blue, red, pink, and so on, while there are still reds, and then always in, this, in the same order, yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, and black. Right? So let's use types to encode snooker, because why not? 
uh, that's a simple type for all the color balls, right? It's a sum type or an enumeration, all the color balls. And that's something like a table function that, you know, uh, given a, a colored ball produces the number of points you get if you plot this ball successfully. So if we want to describe shots, and it's going to be a bit verbose now, uh, you have some shot construct, that, that is, well, some shot being taken, and we would like to produce valid breaks of those shots, valid sequences that are according to the rules I've just described. So, you know, you, you always port the balls in the correct order. So this stuff we need to sequence shots. And we need, you see, a shot is a function from type to type. So we have an additional type variable there. For example, we can fill it with the natural type and keep score. So every shot will be assigned a score uh, how much points we earned by putting this uh, or that ball. Okay, so then the uh, value for uh, potting a red would look like this. It's a shot of natural and it's just one point for potting it, right? And then a the color is something like that. I not sure you can see it properly, but it's just that function that we defined, right, to convert uh, the color given into the uh, number of points. So then we can write something like that. With all those preparations, we can write programs like that look like this. So a break, you know, a sequence of shots is something like that. So you, you put a red, then you and a color, and then you choose blue because you can choose any color, then you have to plot a red again, then pink, and so on and so forth, right? So that's, that's a break, six balls. But what if we uh, write something naughty? What if we write, uh, what if we add, what if we plot a color after another color? This is not allowed, but unfortunately the compiler will allow it because it doesn't, doesn't really care. We can link any, any kind of shots together, unfortunately. So let's fix that with state machines. So what are state machines? Very roughly, very, uh, well, uh, a very brief definition of those would be uh, that's the state machine of, of you, of the attendees of the uh, Runners Clubs conference. You have red stage state, right? You have green stage state. And when you're in the state, it means you're in the audience somewhere on the respective stage. And then you get tired, the bored of the talk, and then you uh, proceed to the coffee area where you have some coffee and then your curiosity is replenished and then you can go, go back and listen to some more talks. And then later we'll also have the blue stage state and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, you have states and you have transitions and there are preconditions to those transitions. It means that something has to be, there is, there is some uh, um, predicate that has to be fulfilled for the transition to occur, right? So that's that. And you model your uh, application state with state machines sometimes. Uh, you describe all your states and transitions between them and then you can deduce some properties about, about that. So for us, the state machine would look something like that. We begin in the red state, we have to put a red, then we're in the color state, then any of the colors and we're back to the red state. That's not all the, ru of the, all the rules of snooker, if anyone's familiar, of course, but that's a start. That makes sense, right? So how do we encode that? Uh, let's start by describing what ball is now on, so to say. What ball is an ob ob object ball now? Do we have to plot a red or a color? So that's the alternative there with this ball type. And then we can expand our shot type with those two new types in the signature of the type that we've just defined, of the ball type. And those define two states of the state machine that we work with. That means that every shot takes us from some state to the other, right? In from either from red to color, you see the upper arrow, or the lower arrow is from color to red. 
So both are encoded with the ball type. Then we have to update our sequence in a bit. It's a bit tricky, but nothing impossible. We have to just pass the uh, state types through. Uh, that's okay, not a problem. And then that's how we define our red and color functions now. In addition to the net, uh, natural number type parameter, we have to supply the uh, state, uh, the initial state and the final state. So red should take us from the red state to color state, and then color should take us from the color state to the red state. And nothing changes on the value level, really. We only change the type signatures. That makes sense, right? Two operations, two arrows, yeah? two pairs of types. Okay. Uh, now, our break has the type of red to red. So we begin in the red state and we have to end in the red state for this particular break. And the rest is the same, it compiles, but now if we were to add this color green shot, which is illegal, right, the compiler would complain. And to say, what are you doing? Types don't match. You see color green is problematic according to the compiler, and then it tries to reduce the types, and eventually, you see specifically section here, it says that color is not matching red. It ex uh, expected the red type there, you know, because that's where the color took us, color blue. We are back to the red state, but we find ourselves in the color state, which is wrong. So you can't do that, and the compiler uh, rejects this code. Okay. Well, clear, more or less, so far? Yeah, I see people nodding. Cool. Thank you. And thanks for coming, by the way. Uh, now, of course, we have a finite number of reds on the table. Typically, it's 15. If you want a quick game, it's also 10 or 6. Doesn't really matter, let's say 15. So we can't have a break that goes on forever. But unfortunately, right now, with our types, we allow that. So what do we do? Let's enrich our state and let's extend it. Let's add a natural type variable there, right? So we will have an infinite number of possible states and this natural number will just encode the number of reds that we have on the table, on the type level, right? So now we have, uh, we replace our ball in the shot signature with the game state that uh, has, in addition to the ball that is now on, has the number of reds remaining on the table. And where does it uh, leave us? That's how we type our break now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we start with 15 reds, for example, and red is on, and we should end with 12 reds, and the red is on, so in between those states, we somehow have to legally pot three reds and some colors. And that's what we do, and that compiles and type checks and all that. Now, if we add another red to the sequence, the compiler will complain because we don't have any more reds, and specifically, there's going to be a type mismatch between zero and one on the type level because we're trying to make a transition from a state uh, that has uh, zero reds, but we expect a state that has uh, at least one red, so we can actually plot it, right? So zero is not one. That's the same type mismatch as you know string and integer, but just a bit more with a bit more noise around it. You know, but it's it's, it's very helpful noise. So we can do it, and of course we can't have too few reds because then we will never reach the state of 12 reds. You know, types won't align. We'll, we'll have a state of uh, 13 reds and red is on, but we need state 12 reds. Okay. I remind you now that we have two phases. So once we're done with the reds, that's the finite state machine so far. We'll have to advance to the second stage of the game where we pot the colors. So once we're done with the reds, you see it became conditional. We then pot the yellow, the green, the brown, uh, and then we reach the end of the game, right? 
So we pot the reds and arbitrary colors while we still have reds. We run out of reds. We just uh, pot the colors. So how do we encode that? Our state type gets a bit more complicated now. Uh, it has three alternative for three phases of the game. The first phase is called reds and natural number there encodes the number of reds we have on the table, right? Nothing changed there. And the ball is the ball which is on the object ball, red or color. Then we have the color stage and the color ball that is uh, now on. It's yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, black. And finally the end stage, you know, just so it's clear that the game is now complete. That's our state type. So then our red, uh, our red function, our red value is going to have this type, you know, so for the initial state, we're starting in the reds, uh, reds phase of the game. And here you see we're using a pattern matching on the natural number. We're saying, okay, it has to be uh, a successor of some number reds. So it can be zero. That's what we mean with this construct. So S of reds, it means that reds plus one. So there has to be at least reds there, right? Reds can be zero, but S of reds is at least one. So we expect that by using this type signature. And then you see the f state that we transition into is reds, just reds, right? We change red to color. We're still in the reds phase but we now have reds on the table. That means we potted one red, so we went from reds plus one to reds. So that's what red does now. And that's, that's the, the entire thing is the type signature, of course. The color ball is defined similarly, except it doesn't really change the number of reds on the table because you just pot the color, it's respotted. How, how many, however many reds you had on the table, you will still have them. And we have this transition function that's called last red color, which is an awkward name. And it's specifically for the color that we pot when we run out of reds. Okay. It means that it matches, you see, with pattern matching reds, Z color. That means that the color has to be on and we have zero reds. That's our state. That's the requirement. That's the precondition. And then we end up in the colors phase and the yellow is on the first, the smallest color. So that's the, that's explicitly the last red, last color that you put after the last red. That's the actual name. Okay. So then we define a few helper functions, helper values for the rest of the colors. And they're really trivial. We start, we're always in the colors phase and we start from a specific color to another specific color and on and on it goes for, for green is from green to brown just the number of score or points varies right from color ball to color ball and then eventually we reach black which goes from colors black to the end phase right that's our final arrow in our final state machine and let's see uh, if we can go from three reds you see there are three reds and the red is on to the end and yes we can we just do that red color red color red then last color so we transition into the second phase and then yellow, green, brown, yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, black. We use all the values and that's a valid program. Of course, if we change, if we do something uh, bad, then uh, it's going to complain. For example, if we do uh, pink before the blue, right? It's not allowed. You have to pot blue first and then the pink. So it's going to complain, it's going to say that pink is not blue. So one, one, just one more thing with those uh, state machines is how you handle fouls. A foul is when you pot a ball or not, but you uh, break the rules somehow. For example, you pot the cue ball together with the object ball, or you uh, fail to hit any ball at all, or well, something bad happens, let's say. And that's the analogy of having an exception or error in your application, you know, in between state transitions. That's Mark Allen. He has just lost because of the file of the final foul on the final black. So he's disappointed. Uh, 
So our uh, state machine gets even more complicated. Let's consider in the red phase, in the red phase, how we uh, handle fouls. So we start there in the middle state with n reds. If we pot a red, we go to the color phase and number of reds decreases by one. If we uh, fouled and didn't pot the red, the red is still on the table, we just go back to the same state, right? We still have n reds, we just fouled, and now it's our opponent's turn. And finally, we can pot and foul, so the red goes in, but we foul somehow, for example, the cue ball also goes in, and then we have the state where we have again n reds minus one, but still the next player has to start with a red, not the color. So that's the, uh, that's how our FSM is defined. And you see that there are now conditions. So it's not really clear because from one state, we can go to the other state, to the second state, or to even to the same state, state itself. So how do, we, how do we encode that? We have, uh, let's have a data type for short result. That's gonna replace our natural type uh, that we use for scoring. Uh, so every shot is either a pot, nice, or a foul, and then there is a Boolean value that indicates where uh, the ball had, go in, had gone in or not, right? So if it's true, then the ball had indeed gone in. And we're going to use this trick in our shot signature. Uh, it used to go from ball state to, well, ball state, uh, right? Phase of the game and so on. But now uh, we're gonna replace our final state with a function that depends on the uh, type that we have as our first argument, which is going to be shot result. So that means that our next state will depend on the shot result. Depending on the shot result, we'll transition to one of those three possible uh, states, right? So how does that work out? Syntax is really not important here, but you understand that it's now a function, right? So it used to be a specific value, now it's a function. And you can do it, you can do it in Idris, which is really complicated to, to implement such a type system and really impressive. So now, uh, color ball are still simple because we don't consider fouls on color balls because they get respotted, so it doesn't really care if it goes in or not. So we're using the const function to always go to a specific state. What's the const function? Const function, just as a reminder or or an introduction, it's just a function of two arguments that always uh, returns the first argument. So if you want a function that always returns a three, no matter what we give it as a second argument, then we partially apply it and we get such a function, right? So that's what we do there on the type level. It's a type level function, can be work on the type level as well. So we always will return that state, no dependency really. Uh, and now red is a whole other story because there we take uh, the result, the short result value, which is a pot to a foul, right? And we write this lambda function and then we pattern match. Was it a pot? Was it a foul and the ball had gone in? Was it a foul and the ball had not gone in? And we all always return some kind of new state. Right, so this function takes the result and matches it to some state. And that's, that's just the type signature of, of the red value. That's, that's the huge type signature. It's a, it's a lambda function in a type signature. And the compiler is smart enough to realize that uh, something uh, complex is going on there. So it will ask us questions, but more of that later. Uh, last red color is also trivial. We again use our const function because if you consider it, there is no options to take there. We always will proceed to the next game phase. So let's try it out. Uh, first we define the second phase just as a helper break so we don't have to come back to it. It's really trivial. It goes from colors yellow to uh, const end, right? We now have to apply the constant function because there has to be a function there, the second argument. So it goes from col colors yellow to end. That's clear, right? And now let's have a break, N not 
a pause, but uh, snooker break there, uh, we'll start with just one red, and we want to reach the end, so we're gonna take red, then last uh, color for the last red, let's take pink, for example, and then we advance to the second phase. So what would the compiler say is that, of course, it's not correct, because what if that red failed, right? What if that wasn't a pot? So it says here that, okay, because you defined it as a dependency, you should do some verification. You can't just say that pot uh, taking a shot at red advances our finite state machine into the uh, phase where, into the state where the color is on, right? It's not enough. So we have to do some, some work you see, that's the part that doesn't match. It says, okay, it produces reds, zero, and color is now on, nice, but that's only if it's spotted. And it says, okay, the type is a bit more complicated than that. It's a function, right, of on types. So you always, uh, you have to mirror this type level function on the value level. You have to write something like that code on the value level, and that's exactly what we're doing here. So we take the result from uh, taking a shot at red, and depending on if it's pot or foul and which kind of foul, we go to different stages. We, we, uh, we have to resume our break with different balls, right? That assuming that that's the uh, second player or taking this turn after we, the first player fouled. So we always start with a different, different ball depending on uh, if uh, a foul uh, had happened or and how exactly it happened. And now it compiles. And finally, you could realize that it's even more complicated and this, this function has to be even more complex uh, because it also depends whether all reds are, uh, have been potted or not. S but no problem, we can also do that. So we can depend on the result of the shot in the next state of the state machine, and we can depend on the number of reds in the uh, previous state. We can mix and match them in our function, and you know, some nested pattern matching, and it's there. And of course, we'll have to handle it accordingly on the value level when we write our program. So, to conclude, that was the analogy of course, you know, I don't expect that you will all go and write the snooker app or something like that, but uh, the rules of snooker is your domain logic rules, your business logic, um, which usually has some restrictions, some specifics. It's a bit like game rules. And then uh, you, what transitions from state to state is your application, right? And usually it's very clear. It's uh, log in, log out, check out, all those states, if you just uh, enumerate them and define all the transitions between them, that's, uh, then you can model your state with a finite state machine. So a break, a snooker break, is a sequence of valid actions that change the state. You know? So how many times uh, you would have to write state modifications and then write unit tests. So you get, always get a valid state for those edge cases. Instead, you can use dependent types to verify that it is always so. And finally, a foul is an error or exception that occurred in a transition between states. Because of course, no one is completely, uh, no application is completely free of errors and exceptions. So where to go from here if you like that stuff? There is an entire world, you know, that's going on somewhere. You know, there's a lot of research being done. The author of Idris, Edwin Brady, is about to release the second version of his language. There is uh, this conference called ICFP, which is just the biggest conference on functional programming in the world. This uh, summer, this year, luckily it's, uh, it's in Berlin. It's in a week. You can still buy tickets. And this guy is going to be presenting there. So you could go and ask him questions about dependent types. And of course, there is this book, which is basically the substrate I used to build my talk upon. Uh, it's a very good book. 
even if you are not familiar with Haskell or any other programming language you know, that is like Haskell, you can read this book. It starts from you know, very early beginnings, almost from scratch. And the uh, final chapters are finite state machines, actually, uh, with dependent types and dependent types used for concurrency, which is another great topic, by the way. So, yeah, you can also learn Haskell. Dependent types are coming to Haskell, and even without them, Haskell is a wonderful language, and there are lots of interesting type hacks you can use to uh, write on the type level, and even TypeScript, like I said, a lot of type level programming is being done there, surprisingly, uh, so the type system is quite flexible, even though it's not, of course, as powerful as in other languages. So that would be it, that's all I've got, and now we're gonna use this state machine uh, if you have any questions. If you don't have any questions, we'll just proceed to the final state. Thank you very much. Okay, Sasha, thanks for your talk. Questions? I have questions. One, two, three. Mm. Hi, Alexander. Hi. Um, I very impressed your slide with N. Queen's uh, example. <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive, yeah, that and article. It's and at all, your talk really impressed me. <coughs> and um, you, you describe all really clear, and it makes sense for me. But I have only one question uh, about your last read shot function type definition. Yeah. Could you open please slide sure. with this type definition? That would be <coughs> um, yeah, this yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So why do you hard code the yellow color on the last state? Do, do we need uh, on every last red shot uh, switch to the yellow ball to the next shot? Ah, a snooker question, I like that. Yeah. It's, uh, <coughs> <laughs> Uh, so, y imagine y you've potted the last red, yeah. now you have to pot any color, any yeah. color at all, you choose black. It should black. be any color, why yellow? Why even yellow color? Yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's the last, last color thing. You, you pot the black, for example, so that's the state you were in. Y uh, the face of the game is reds, there are zero reds left on the table, and the uh, colored balls are on, so any color. You pick black, and from that you go to the colors phase, and it's always it, it always begins with yellow. Why? <laughs> that's that's how the game is. That's uh, uh, ah. that's the sequence. I'll, I'll show you the the FSM once again. Here, so you see that's ah, the yeah. first phase of the game: red color, red color, red color, red color, red color. No more reds. One last color. And then yellow, green, brown, blue, pink, black. Yeah, okay, I see. So that's why we always start with yellow. That's why after the last uh, red, you put a color, and from that color, you always go to the yellow is on state. Yeah, great. Thanks. Cool. Back to our questions. If uh, some stop. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what uh, will happen if we already shot uh, yellow in the uh, first phase and uh, how yellow ball will appear on the board uh, in the second uh, phase if it's gone? Another simple question. Uh, the referee takes it out of the pocket and okay, puts okay. it on a specific spot on the uh, table. Actually, uh, I have another question. Sure. Uh, I can uh, write a quick sort, for example, in 10 minutes or something like that, and uh, to formally prove it uh, with dependent types, uh, I must spend a, a week or something like that. So do you think uh, dependent types programming will be more easier with some time? So uh, maybe some technologies will right or something like that well the technologies are emerging let's say like 
programming languages are there and libraries and practices and so on and so forth. It's evolving. Uh, what's lacking is, of course, adoption. So people won't really waste their time on proofing something that they you know, can just verify with a few simple tests and then uh, it goes. But there are sensitive tasks, of course, such as programming for um, financial markets, you know, fast trading or some uh, really, um, uh, well, something that works with um, like embedded software, something sensitive that works with cryptography, which reminds me of blockchain. There is a formally verified blockchain and you don't have to formally verify uh, everything, like with theorems or dependent types. Sometimes writing very descriptive and elaborate types is enough. That, and that's already something, and as soon as it's supported in the languages, like in TypeScript, which is a pretty mainstream language by now, then it's good, you can use it. And there is no reason you shouldn't. It's not that difficult, it's just, to, I think it's a matter of, oh, well, it's a trade-off, like everything else. Okay. Um, another question. All this code is written on Haskell on Idris syntax. That's Idris. Oh, because it's very similar to Haskell. Yeah, it's inspired by Haskell and it's just, yeah, you, you write. The boss language use Kindle Mingler notation, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I understood 10%, but they were amazing. And uh, I have two questions, one more theoretical and one practical. Uh, first uh, question, uh, if we have very complicated type system, it can be Turing complete. So we have halting problem. Yes. Uh, and we can describe some types and our compiler never stop. Yes. Uh, how modern language uh, with a uh, very complicated type system handle it? That's why Idris, is, uh, Idris 2 is written in Idris. So you can have more, uh, more guarantees about the termination as well. There's even a termination helper in the Idris uh, interactive command line. It's colon total. It verifies some of the functions. It, of course, not any function. It can verify if it's uh, if it terminates or not. So that's uh, one thing. And the other, of course, you know, some compilers like the TypeScript compiler can't handle all the recursive types. And for example, there is um, a constant hard-coded limitation there that just stops evaluating. 50 something, I think. Hmm? 50 something. Yeah, 40 something. Like 50, yeah. 50, uh, maybe 50. It's, it's an arbitrary number, I don't know. Yeah, but something like that. And the second question, um, we try, we describe our state of the f uh, flow. It's another type system. And uh, we had a problem how to test it. Because you describe some uh, types and uh, they are very complicated. And who guarantee that type are correct? So the uh, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe you make some errors in your types and you, uh, in your talk, you modified your types several times because you have some uh, issues yeah. in your type. So uh, it's good practice to make some tests. For, for yeah. Because there are a lot of logic in tests now, uh, in types now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the types have become quite complicated, yes. But how test it? So, of course, that doesn't mean that you don't need unit tests because eventually you will run into cases that uh, can be described using a type system. So then you will just write unit tests or as a better alternative, you use property-based testing and generative testing in general. So you're trying to prove some properties of your code by generating random samples that you feed into some test. For example, you, for every input, the absolute value function has to produce a positive number. So you generate, you write, okay, give me 10,000 arbitrary numbers, run them through the absolute value function, collect the results, and all the results should have the property that they're above zero. So it's a trivial example, but uh, you can use that to test something that you can't describe with types, because eventually you will uh, already when writing this uh, talk, I uh, had to work around some limitations in the type system, so 
then you just use unit tests to have guarantees, but you can be smart about that as well. 